Um, it's an honor to me to be back here. Um, it, when I was in my 20s working for ABC News, my first assignment as a beat reporter in my life was covering then Governor Clinton. Uh, a long, long time ago, uh, far, far away to a state I had never been, but spent most of 1992 here. Uh, and um, this, was, this was a long time back, and, and I learned a lot. And I want to talk a little bit about what I learned about, uh, about the Clintons and about Hillary Clinton uh, when I was here. Uh, to give you an idea of how much I learned, it, I learned during that period that, uh, from Rodney Slater that being the Arkansas Highway Commissioner is a more important job than being Secretary of Transportation for the United States. <laughs> that was an important thing to learn. Um, I learned that, that uh, there is not a nicer, more civil person in the world than, uh, than Mac McClarty. That was also an important thing to learn. Uh, and I learned a lot, as I said, about the Clintons. Um, a lot of the things I think I learned that year covering them are things that um, a lot of the country and a lot of the world has learned. Um, but I got to learn them uh, in a different and a special way. Uh, and let me just talk about what some of those are and, and then how they, how they related to the book um, uh, uh, that we reported out. Um, all the candidates are featured in our book, and, and our book focuses on the candidates and their spouses. That was our idea from the beginning and what we tried to execute. And, and we, we both think that part of the reason that people were, are interested in the book is because as much coverage as there was of this campaign, um, there wasn't a lot of time for people to go back and say, what really happened for these principal players? Uh, not the strategists and the polls and the tactics and the media coverage, but for the candidates and their spouses. And our book, uh, primarily focuses uh, to some extent on the relationship between S Secretary Clinton and the President, President Obama, uh, how they came together. Uh, but the Clintons are, uh, as they have been since, uh, since uh, President Clinton ran in 1991, started running in 1991, they've really been at the center of American politics and of, and of the world on the world stage. Um, one thing I learned about them that year is that uh, both uh, Secretary Clinton and President Clinton are in public life for the right reason. Uh, so many people who run for politics and, and try to be involved in politics um, uh, do it uh, because they want power or they, they can't find anything else more interesting to do. Even people, I think, who oppose the Clintons, uh, in almost every case, recognize that both of them are extraordinarily oriented towards helping people, towards public service. And, uh, and the, the library and the school are, are testament to that. But so is everything they did in Arkansas and everything they did in Washington. Another thing that I, that I learned that year covering them, and, uh, I was assigned early enough that uh, there were literally days when I was the only reporter on a small plane, uh, often with uh, Governor Clinton and Bruce Lindsay and, and one or two aides, uh, occasionally with uh, uh, the First Lady of Arkansas at the time. And um, again, uh, they are an extraordinarily uh, highly scrutinized couple, uh, and lots has been written about their marriage. I think it, it's, it's obvious to anyone who's been able to observe them in close range, as, as almost all of you have, as I was privileged to do that year, is they're extraordinarily dedicated to each other. They're extraordinarily focused on uh, the partnership that they have uh, to try, again, try to make the world a better place, but also to, uh, to raise their daughter, which they've done so successfully. And I saw that uh, again in 1992 and, and, and since, and, and also again in, in the campaign. Um, and then finally I'd say, and I've sort of alluded to this, is the Clintons, as I learned that year, excite extraordinary passions uh, in their supporters. And, and I was able to meet that year people like uh, 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 Mac McClarty, Ms. Shackelford, other people from Arkansas who would walk through walls for the Clintons, who were inspired by them, whose roles in public life were really uh, 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 fostered by the Clintons. And yet, that year I also met people like um, uh, Sheffield Nelson and Cliff Jackson, I hear no laughter, that surprises me, um, who, there you go, who, um, who were inspired by the Clintons in a different way whose roles in public life uh, seemed animated as much as anything by a desire to uh, oppose the Clintons, and, and the Clinton supporters would say destroy the Clintons. And um, the Clintons themselves, I think, have struggled with that to try to understand. Uh, and John and I have both talked to both of them over the years. Uh, why is it that they inspire this kind of uh, loyal following, but, but more confusingly, uh, this extra extraordinary enmity that uh, really has, has uh, dogged them in Arkansas and followed them onto the national stage and certainly played uh, a role in, in Senator, then Senator Clinton's uh, efforts to run for president in the year when she was a front runner. So I took all of that, uh, all of those lessons and others about both Clintons uh, into uh, my coverage of them in Washington uh, during the presidential years. And then uh, when Senator Clinton decided to run for Senate from New York where we live now, 
uh, I was fascinated by her decision uh, because, as you all know, in Arkansas, there was often talk of her running for public office, and she never did. Uh, and her decision to do that from a different state was quite interesting and, and brought a whole bunch of challenges. And, and uh, one of the challenges that we had in writing about them was they, are, they have been written about so much over the years. Um, not just in daily journalism and weekly journalism, but there have been a lot of books written about the Clintons. And so uh, one of the daunting challenges we faced in sitting down to write Game Change was how do you write about the Clintons in a way that's new uh, and interesting? And one, one way we thought we might be able to do that is we felt we understood them uh, pretty well. And we understood them in a way that was not animated either by a, a rose-colored view that the Clintons never do anything wrong uh, or, or by an animus uh, that animates a lot of the journalism about the Clintons. We tried to, to draw on, on our relationships and knowledge with them as well as the people around them to say what can we say about them that's, that's new and interesting and, and accurate. And there's a number of things in the book uh, that I want to talk about briefly that go to this question of, of, uh, of, the, of what we were able to learn new about, about the Clintons, and particularly about the candidate, this time candidate Clinton being her and not him, uh, that hadn't been written about before. Um, one of the things we learned, which we did not know and, and had not been reported before we uh, started to, to, to report for the book, is that Hillary almost ran for president in 2004. Um, she uh, was on her book tour and being encouraged by people she'd meet during book events, but also by public officials and, and uh, uh, business leaders, people saying she should run. And at the time they were encouraging her, you'll recall that John Kerry, who'd been the front runner for the Democratic nomination, this is in 2003 for the 2004 cycle. He had declined, looked like his campaign was dead, and Howard Dean looked like he was gonna be the Democratic nominee. The Clintons had a long time relationship with Governor Dean. They thought he'd be a very weak general election candidate. And so Hillary spent a number of weeks really looking closely at the question of should she enter the race. One of the main things on her mind was the fact that she'd promised the people of New York that she wouldn't run for president, that she'd serve at her full term. And that really she really struggled with that. Hillary describes herself, as, as most of you know, as having a responsibility gene. And she felt like she told people explicitly she'd serve out her term and she needed to. Now, she had an analog to look at, which is her husband, who of course had told the people of Arkansas that he wouldn't run for president, that he'd serve out his term when he was running against Sheffield Nelson for re-election. And uh, then proceeded to drive around the state and ask people to be uh, freed from his promise. Um, uh, I think in Arkansas we call that kabuki, um, and, uh, and was freed by his, his definition of what, what was required and, and used an argument that said the country faces so many challenges, uh, President Bush has messed so much up that I need to run to help not just Arkansas but the country. Of course Hillary could have made the same argument, she wouldn't even need to change the name of the incumbent president uh, for, to run in, in 2004, uh, but she, she did what she always does, she was careful. She did polling, she talked to a lot of people, but very quietly, so quietly it never leaked out until our book, and then had a, a series of meetings. She looked at the rules on delegates, and then finally decided at one meeting, uh, the last meeting, even though almost everybody around her was for it, that she wouldn't do it. President Clinton was for it, thought she'd be the best president, thought she could win. Uh, some of her advisors, including some Arkansans, were for it. The person in the room at the last meeting who was against it was Chelsea who drew on this argument that she'd promised not to run. And so she decided not to. Uh, and that was a pretty fateful thing. One of the people who told her she should run was uh, Patty Solis Doyle, who came to Little Rock uh, around the same time I did in 1991 to work with uh, Hillary as, as her scheduler, and then of course rose up uh, to work with her in the White House and then as her campaign manager. At the time was her top political advisor and told her, this is your time. Uh, one of the things you learn in presidential politics and we write about in the book is, people think, well, maybe I won't run this year, I'll run in four years. Well, the window closes. Just because you're poised to possibly run in one cycle doesn't mean the window's gonna stay open for the next cycle. And Hillary was told this is your time, not just by Patty, but by others, and she decided not to do it, in large part to fulfill her promise to the people of New York. Well, what happens, of course, is John Kerry comes back, becomes a Democratic nominee, and decides to pick as his keynote speaker at the Democratic Convention in Boston, uh, Barack Obama. Uh, the Senate candidate from Illinois, and of course, if he, if Kerry, if Hillary had run, won, run, I think she would have been the nominee. I think she would have been president, to tell you the truth. But she, if she had stopped John Kerry, Barack Obama would not have been in a position to challenge her four years later. Um, and so that was a pretty fateful decision. And of course, for Obama to get in the race, he
he had to do exactly what hillary refused to do when he got in in two thousand eight he had told the people of illinois that he was going to serve at his full term just like bill clinton and unlike hillary clinton he decided he could get out of that just by deciding he was out of it and was able to run and, and of course beat her just let me talk about a couple things else before i turn over to john uh, about hillary that that we learned um, in doing the book that we did not know people who look at the conclusion of the book and pardon me for giving away the ending but she becomes secretary of state in the obama administration um, people some people a lot of people are surprised i was surprised i, I gave a speech in los angeles uh, the day before hillary went to chicago uh, to interview with obama for the job and was asked if there was any chance hillary uh... would would uh... would possibly take a job in the obama administration and i said something fittingly arkansan like when pigs fly i didn't say when i didn't say when hogs fly i probably should have but but I was surprised, too, because I saw their relationship through the prism of most of the country, which was their contentious fight for the Democratic nomination, where, as things can happen in primaries, things got pretty rough. One of the things we discovered in reporting Game Change is that the Clintons, both Clintons, had a relationship with Barack Obama in 2004. Hillary went to Chicago not once but twice to do fundraisers for Obama, including on one occasion when the weather in Chicago was quite bad. She was sitting on the tarmac uh, at an airport outside Baltimore, and uh, waiting to get clearance to take off. And the pilot said, we could be here a while because, because the weather's so bad in Chicago. And the staff said, you know, maybe we shouldn't go. Maybe we should just abort this, uh, as often happens with charter flights. And, and she said, no, I want to go. It's important to go. And she did, and she was very impressed with them. She came back from Chicago and told her staff, there's a superstar in Chicago. If you think about the Clintons and their record on race relations, um, uh, something John will talk about, I believe, you, you know, you know that they, Barack Obama is just the kind of person the Clintons would have championed as a national figure if it hadn't turned out that in order to champion him, they'd have to, um, or for, for Hillary to win, they'd have to destroy him and beat him. But uh, Bill Clinton went out and did a fundraiser for Obama in Chicago. Hillary had him in a fundraiser for him in their Washington home. So uh, they were incredibly uh, close. When Obama won, he came to Washington. He had a problem, which was how do you be a celebrity senator? someone world famous, very popular, very in demand by the media, by the public, and still get things done in an institution where people who've been there like a prior or a bumpers for years and years have seniority and don't want to see some young person, some new senator come in. So he turned to Hillary for advice. And as much as he was a loner in the Senate, as much as he didn't like it, he, he was dri drawn to her and, and sought her out for advice. So they were close. And that was a surprise as well to us, uh, just how close they were. And, Knowing that, you can see then that the middle part, the part that we all watched unfold, unfold in real time, that's the surprise, that's the aberration, that they had such a contentious relationship and their coming back together at the end was in fact kind of a fulfillment of, of, uh, of uh, the, the uh, early ties that they had. Let me stop there. Well, I'm sure talk more about the Clintons in the Q&A, but uh, I'll turn it over to John. Thank you, Mark. Um, and thank you everybody for coming out today um, from me too. Um, I mean, well, I'll make explicit one thing that Mark didn't say at the beginning, which is that we've we decided in our limited time here that we would talk about the Clintons, um, primarily for obvious reasons, uh, out of um, uh, the, it seems appropriate given the setting. Uh, but we're obviously happy to talk about um, in the question, in the Q and A session, we're happy to talk about Barack Obama, Sarah Palin, John McCain, anyone uh, else that you like. Um, you know, one of the reasons that we decided to do the book, in addition to what Mark said about how we thought we could, these were these kind of big characters. <clears throat> who had obviously riveted the country in a way that most politicians don't. These were people who were interesting in a way that, you know, say John Kerry is not interesting, um, which is to say they're interesting. Um, what was that even um, after all the coverage of this race, there were still really kind of basic foundational questions that were not answered um, to, to, I think, to our satisfaction, and, and we read a lot more of the coverage and watched a lot more of the coverage than the average citizen. And among the kind of really basic questions that, that Mark and I felt like we didn't have answers to were things like, you know, how did Barack Obama actually decide to run for president? I mean, what was it that convinced him given his limited resume uh, and the big hurdles he faced as an African American with the last name Hussein or the middle name Hussein? Um, how did he get it in his head that he could actually run for and win the office of, of, of the presidency? Um, you know, how, how on earth did Sarah Palin ever get on the Republican ticket? Um, a question that, a question that you know, many people had tried to answer in a very short window of time, but had never really been explained, and we tried to do that in the book. But, but, but I think, you know, if you thought, talk, talked about Americans during the campaign, one of the most 
that fundamental questions that went around the water coolers all over the country for two years was what, what role did Bill Clinton actually play in his wife's, wife's campaign? You know, what, 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 is, what is Bill Clinton doing um, to or for uh, Hillary? And, and that was a question that Mark and I thought we had some insight into, but we wanted to spend some more time studying it, which is what we did in the book. And, and if you read it, you'll see, uh, you'll get, a, I think, a, a, a much clearer picture of how that dynamic worked um, than anybody has, has caught on paper, at least about this campaign before. But I want to talk a little bit about the, about the former president in that context. The, the, the big answers to that question are as follows. Um, and and there, it's, a, it's sort of a, a, a two-part answer. Um, the first answer is that in the course of 2007, the answer is hardly at all was Bill Clinton involved in his wife's campaign, to a much less extent than anybody imagined. And if you remember in 2007, the questions, uh, the, the, pres the presumptions that many people had were that either he was, um, uh, if, you, if you didn't like the Clintons, he was the secret hidden hand who was controlling Hillary Clinton's campaign. And if you thought well of the Clintons, you thought, well, he's the smartest politician in America and he's a great asset for her. But in either case, the presumption was that he was deeply involved in, in her strategy. In fact, what we discovered in writing the book was that um, he was less involved than most uh, normal spouses are in their wives' campaigns or their husbands' campaigns, uh, as the case may be. And there was a reason for that. I mean, partly it was in his case he felt very strongly that, um, that, that he respected his wife's political skills, he respected his wife as a person, and he thought it was very important for her to run her own campaign and to, to feel as though she was standing on her own two feet, she was choosing her own team, he had confidence that she could, could do that well, and she needed to feel that in order to be the, the strong candidate that she could be. It was also important that he not be seen to be the hidden hand in her campaign, and that was recognized as a political issue, both by him and by many of the people around her, that, that if she was going to uh, cross, cross the, the threshold, um, uh, and a tough threshold for any female candidate for president, uh, of being uh, seen as a, as a credible commander-in-chief, she couldn't be seen as having a crutch uh, in Bill Clinton. And so it, 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 is a, it was a, a, a decision that they all, uh, the people around her and the president himself, were, were all sort of on board with this notion that she needed to fly solo. And you'll remember in 2007, perhaps, that you know, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton did not do a public event together uh, until the summer of 2007. She'd been running for six months before they went to Iowa together and first ever stepped out on the public stage together. And it was true also behind the scenes. What, what that, that, though, though that was the case, what was also true was that Bill Clinton was extremely and growingly frustrated over the course of the year as what he had hoped would be the case, which was that his wife's campaign would be extremely competent and well-run and savvy and disciplined. None of those things were true and in his view. And he became more and more frustrated as the year went on, and primarily his frustration uh, owed to the fact that he thought that none of them were taking Barack Obama seriously enough. Um, they seemed to have the view that either that he was going to be a passing phenomenon, and there was some reason to think that was true. He was not a very good candidate, Barack Obama, in 2007. Um, the, many of the people around Hillary Clinton kind of dismissed him uh, and thought that he was, he was a fad, he might be a celebrity, but that he was not tough enough uh, to take her on. They also looked, obviously, at the national polls which had her ahead uh, by, in some cases, as much as 30 points, 35 points into the fall of 2007. There, in almost every state, Hillary Clinton was ahead by, by many, many, many points, um, with the exception of Iowa, where she always struggled. But Bill Clinton's view was uh, that Barack Obama had an enormous amount of talent, uh, that his stance on the Iraq War, the clarity with which he had spoken out against the Iraq War as opposed to Hillary's vote to authorize it uh, in 2003 uh, was, was a problem with, with uh, Democratic primary uh, voters. And further, that because he was an African American, if he ever proved himself to be a credible candidate, he would eat into a huge part of what had always been the Clinton, the core base of the Clinton support, which was in the, among the black vote. And, and so Bill Clinton saw in a way that many of the people around her did not see uh, the, the potential for trouble that Barack Obama could be. And as I say, he grew increasingly frustrated throughout the year uh, as nothing was done by Hillary Clinton's campaign to take uh, Obama on. Um, you, you will see in the, in, the, in the book that there's a moment where, um, where, where the, 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 the corner starts to turn for him, where his frustration mounts to the point where he speaks out on a Charlie Rose interview uh, in December, which some of you may remember, in December of 2007, where he, he kind of goes on the attack in a, in, a, in a somewhat unauthorized way, his wife's campaign 
uh, had wanted him to, to, to not become the center of attention, certainly not to attack Obama, uh, but Bill Clinton felt that the time had come. They'd wasted too much time, and they'd let Obama get too big, and he could see that he was now a threat. And he kind of, um, in a very forceful way, um, spoke out on that program at a very at a very minimal prompting on the part of Charlie Rose, who who, who was really there to talk about Clinton's latest book um, on philanthropy, but when he, as soon as he threw Barack Obama's name on the table, the president pounced. Um, and, uh, and, and, and uncorked a, a critique, which was not just a critique of Barack Obama, but a critique of the other thing that Bill Clinton was incredibly frustrated with, which was the coverage of the, the, the mass media uh, in the campaign, which he felt throughout the year had been extraordinarily forgiving to Barack Obama and extraordinarily overly tough towards his wife. Um, and the imbalance of that coverage made him uh, very extremely frustrated and angry uh, throughout the year. And he, in, in the course of his Charlie Rose interview, he. He, he gets that out on the table also in, in a, in a full-throated way that he hadn't done before. Um, one of the most vivid scenes in our book, and I said it was a two-part answer, what role did Bill Clinton play the first year? A lot less than people thought. Uh, in, the, the, in the next six months, over the, re the rest of the Democratic primary fight, starting literally in January of 2008, the answer is, to some extent, a lot more than most people really thought. Um, and the, the turning point, as with so much else in the campaign, was it was Iowa. Um, and, and we have, a, at the beginning of the book, in the prologue of the book, um, a, a fairly detailed scene of the Clintons in their hotel room in, in Des Moines on the night that she, um, Hillary dis discovers that she is going to be not just, not only that she's not going to win Iowa, that, but she's going to finish a distant third. A everyone in the Clintons' life in Iowa, the most important advisors they had in the state, had ensured them that she was going to finish either second, well, either first or a very close second. And so the, the blow of her learning that she was a distant third uh, was an extraordinarily harsh psychic blow to them. They had known that Iowa was their most difficult state, but they had continued investing more and more money, pushing more and more chips into the middle of the table on the theory that if she could just win Iowa, the race would effectively be over. And on that night, uh, as you'll see in the book if you, if you, if you read it, um, the, the, the outpouring of, 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 of anger and frustration in the room is, is, is extraordinary and palpable, and it's at that moment where uh, Bill Clinton sort of seizes control of, of his wife's campaign in a lot of ways and says, you know, I'm done with this. I've, I've been, uh, all, I've been, I stayed off stage. I, I was a good husband. I was a good spouse. I stayed out of, the, out of the, the spotlight for the better part of this last year, but she's now on the brink of losing, and I, something needs to be done. And, the, the, and the, the turn of the corner is just that sharp, and literally they arrive in New Hampshire the next day, and it is like old times again. They are uh, two for the price of one. They are campaigning in New Hampshire as a team uh, in the same way that she, Hillary Clinton had kept him at arm's length. She now pulls him close, and they very much as a tandem, as a couple, um, decide to, to go forward uh, into the, for the rest of the, for, for really for the rest of the race. Um, it, the, you know, we, we have, a, a, again in the book, one of the more kind of um, surprising, I think, to Mark and I stories in the book is uh, a meeting that we recount that takes place the day after the New Hampshire primary. Bill and Hillary Clinton, very successful in New Hampshire, obviously, uh, pulled off this incredible upset that many people in the political community, uh, both in the media and among operatives, thought was impossible, and she came back and won this extraordinary victory. And yet, the, and the next day, they are, uh, have gathered all of their senior staff together at her headquarters um, in, in, uh, in suburban Virginia, uh, and they sit down to look at what they now have to do. In, in, in some sense, the race is now even. You know, Barack Obama's won in Iowa, she's won in New Hampshire. Uh, in theory, um, the, 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 the natural order should reassert itself. She, the front runner, has now kind of put the, the insurgent back in his box, and she'll be able to go on and claim the nomination. Um, in fact, um, what the Clintons learn in the course of this meeting um, is, is that she is in much, much more severe trouble than, than most people on the outside know, and to some extent, much more severe trouble than they themselves knew. And so you have this kind of amazing scene of them um, trying to figure out exactly what their situation is. And in a moment when many people would have expected them to be uh, on cloud nine, having won this extraordinary comeback the day before, they are as angry and as upset as many of their closest advisors had ever seen them. Uh, partly this, this owed to the fact that they really only came face to face at that moment with the fact that the campaign was effectively broke. Um, the Clintons, like most politicians, uh, do, do, not, do not like to be at a, significant, at a, at a financial disadvantage in, in any political contest. In this case, they were looking at Barack Obama, who was now raising money hand over fist over the internet uh, as a result of those two races in Iowa and New Hampshire. They uh, were tapped out, effectively, and now heading into two very unpromising contests in Nevada 
and South Carolina. Nevada unpromising in their view because it was a caucus and they felt after Iowa that they were disadvantaged in caucuses and South Carolina where the African American vote would be very large. And I, I, will, I will try to be as brief as I can just in saying that, that what then transpires over the course of the next two months very much is really the ball game in the Democratic race. And what you see in those moments, Bill Clinton uh, being given, being really pulled into the campaign by his wife's desperate advisors for the first time, shown the delegate projections about what is about to unfold over the course of the next few months, where they're spending money, what the polls say from state to state. And there's a, it, it, no one had ever shown him this data before. That is how out of it he had been, out of the, the center of his wife's campaign he had been in 2007. He's looking at this data sitting in their, in their home uh, in Washington. And, and, and literally, you know, saying, you know, I can't believe this. You know, we're about to spend, we've spent all this money, we've devoted all this time, and this is all we've gotten, and this is all we're going to get. What has happened here? Uh, and again, it, it very much fuels the sense that he's had from, from the night of Iowa, now a week later, that he really needs to take control uh, and, and, and basically run things from this point forward and be not just the behind-the-scenes power, but be as much on the front and the front of the, the in the front of the cameras as behind. So you see in... In, uh, as, as behind the stage, you see him in, in Nevada and in South Carolina, out front, uh, advocating in a very passionate way on behalf of his wife, um, but also in a way that is uh, less uh, disciplined than Bill Clinton can be at his best. And partly this is due, as Mark suggested earlier, to the injection into the campaign of the question of race in a way that Bill Clinton found extremely maddening. As you will remember, in New Hampshire, he had made a comment about uh, Barack Obama's Iraq war vote and the coverage of that Iraq war vote as uh, the claim that, that he was pure on the war, where Hillary was soiled on the war. He called that a fairy tale. Many people in the African American community read that quote and thought that he was calling Barack Obama a fairy tale. And Bill Clinton finds himself in a way that is extremely unusual for him given his record on race uh, and extremely uncomfortable for him, given his record on race, his salutary uh, and, and, and largely almost entirely positive record on race relations, he's being called a racist uh, by many of the people in the Democratic Party who he considered his greatest allies for years and years. And, and again, I will not spend a lot of time on this because we don't have that much, but you will see in the book the confluence of the psychology around his desperation to help Hillary Clinton win, driven so much by how about it, by his his genuine desire to help her, how much he loves her, how much he respects her, how much he thought she would be the best president. The desperation of the situation combined with the, the, the anger that he felt and the confusion that he felt over being accused of these things on the question of race that he found inconceivable by former allies, by former friends, by people who he thought he knew and trusted and who he assumed knew better of him. The confluence of that desperation, that anger, leads him to to, to become emotional on the campaign trail in a way that was uh, damaging to Hillary Clinton's campaign for sure, uh, and that uh, put her in a, in, in a bad position with uh, uh, going forward, certainly cast a pall on his image in the media uh, in a way that, that was lastingly, at least in the course of 2008, was lastingly damaging. Um, I, I, will, uh, I, I will skip ahead um, to the very end of the story, which Mark touched on a second ago, so we can, we can finish our prepared comments. Um, to say that there was one other part of the story between Bill and Hillary Clinton, which I think most people, Mark commented about how he was surprised, as we all were in some ways, that she became Secretary of State. Uh, well, there was one other aspect in which, in the same way that people misinterpreted Bill Clinton's involvement in his wife's campaign in 2007, to some extent in 2008, was his role, what his role would be in the context of Secretary of State. Um, many people, I think, assumed when word leaked out that Barack Obama had, had, um, had offered this job to Hillary Clinton, that Bill Clinton would be the biggest stumbling block. And indeed, many people in the Obama administration believe that the question of disclosure uh, around his foundation, around his fundraising efforts, around some of his business dealings around the world, that this would be the biggest hurdle that she would have to overcome. And that if they couldn't clear that stuff up, uh, she would not be able to be uh, installed in that job. And again, many people in the Obama administration did, thought that that was the biggest hur hurdle and, and assumed that Bill Clinton would be incredibly reluctant uh, to, 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 to open his kimono, so to speak, and let people have the kind of, 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 uh, of visibility into his affairs that, that the Obama administration was demanding. Again, outside perception, Bill Clinton, big problem for Hillary Clinton. He's the reason she ultimately won't take the job. In fact, what Mark and I find in the book, and, and it, it, it is the, the concluding piece of the book, the epilogue of the book, we come back to the Clintons again, 
We find Bill Clinton, in fact, being the most uh, ad uh, adamant supporter of her, uh, of her trying to be, become Secretary of State, urging her against her own instincts. She not really sure she wants to work for Obama, not sure she wants to be on the road, not sure she really wants this job. She's tired, she's beat up. She wants to kind of go back to New York and get back to something more of a normal life. Uh, and Bill Clinton is, not, is urging her, lobbying her, telling her that she must do this for her country, that it's an important opportunity, it's an important kind of hinge of history moment, that she has a, a duty, and that he is not going to let anything that has to do with him get in her way. So he does, he takes extraordinary steps uh, to disclose uh, everything that the Obama administration wants, and he ends up being, in some ways, not a hindrance to her taking the job, but in some way the greatest facilitator to her ending up in that job of all the people uh, in her life. So, um, uh, in, in, in so many different ways, um, uh, there was so much about this campaign for Mark and I that um, confounded our expectations and, 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 and took us in places that we didn't expect to end up and led us to conclusions that we didn't expect to reach. But um, there's no question, I think, that uh, as we look at even now at how the Obama administration is operating, the relationship between Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, we can talk about this more in Q&A if you like, but um, uh, again, you know, they, they, the, 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 the working relationship between the President and the Secretary of State has been extraordinarily productive over the course of the last year, and Bill Clinton, who many people thought would be a headache for the administration, uh, has turned out to be an extraordinary asset. Uh, and so, um, uh, yet again, you know, uh, we, uh, we, we, we get to see, even after our book closes, we get to see yet another uh, changing of the game, so to speak. Uh, and uh, we end up in a place where we had not expected, but the, 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 the spectacle continues to be as, as, as fascinating and riveting as ever. Um, so thank you. Um, uh, and as I said before, we're happy to talk about all of our other characters in the book or anything else you want to talk about in the course of our Q&A session. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, Mark. That's a fantastic uh, insider's view that you've exposed us all to here today. And thank you for traveling here to Little Rock as part of your book tour. And We wish you well along the way. Uh, as Skip said earlier, my name is Steve Ronell, and it gives me great pleasure to be here on behalf of the Political Animals Club, which I serve as chairman, a club that Skip Rutherford founded uh, many moons ago in, in uh, 1984. That's still alive and well here today in Little Rock, also in northwest Arkansas. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to co-host this program with the Clinton School. And a quick word about the Clinton School. Uh, Dean Skip Rutherford and his staff at the Clinton School have in a very short time, as we all know, created not only one of the more prolific, but one of the more outstanding and nationally recognized public policy forums in the country right here in Little Rock, Arkansas. And they deserve our appreciation, our support, and our applause. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Rutherford. Thank you, Nikolai. Thank you, the entire uh, staff and students at the Clinton School. Uh, my job today is moderator, and we'll cut this off shortly before 1 o'clock, so we have time to sign some books and meet our speakers here today. But uh, I want to start by uh, congratulating the two of you. I, I saw recently that uh, Sarah Palin uh, was asked to comment about your book, and she spoke out and said, you know, Americans just don't care about this crap. <laughs> So it's going on the back cover of the paper. I, I was wondering if that was if that was something you can add to and put a new cover on that. But clearly, based on the response here in Little Rock today, uh, you sold out the Clinton School. We had to move to this larger venue. I think our Kansans do care about this crap, <laughs> and we do care to have your uh, perspective and your insider's view, uh, ladies and gentlemen. These are two of the finest, finest political journalists in the country today, and it's such an honor to have them here. I'm going to take a moderator's uh, prerogative here and ask the first question, and we'll dive right into Sarah Palin since I threw it out there. Uh, she was here just a few days ago, and, and she's on the minds of many of us here in, in Arkansas. Uh, tell us, I guess answering your own question before, not just how did Sarah Palin become the Republican vice presidential nominee, but how did that, how did that sit with McCain's close advisors on the plane with you and on the campaign with you. And also, uh, Sarah Palin has been almost characterized by the media, so many different sides to her, so many complicated personalities. Tell us what you saw uh, in, in some of those days of the campaign when you truly get to see a candidate broken down and, and see their, their real inner self. Tell us what your experience was. 
Um, let me just quickly echo what you said about this, about the school and about the, this forum. It really is uh, not just regionally but nationally become one of the most recognized and, and sought after. And, and we were so honored when Skip asked us to come down. So we appreciate being here and and and, uh, and being part of such a such what has become so quickly as with most everything in both Bill Clinton's life and Skip Rutherford's life. When they want to do something, they want to not just get it done but get it done quickly, and they have. So thank you again for inviting us. Um, you know, I think one of the, we both think one of the richest uh, things we have in the book is our portrait of Sarah Palin, which we hope, like our portrait of the Clintons and everyone else in the book, is not one dimensional. It's not anti Sarah Palin or pro Sarah Palin. Let me just say a few things that we found that, that speak to your, your excellent questions. One is, as John suggested, that, that, you know, we all thought at the time that Senator McCain's uh, advisors were being less than honest when they said that she had been on the list of people being considered the whole way and that she had been scrutinized as thoroughly as anyone else. I think when you read that portion of the book, you'll find that uh, her name was added to the mix very late. Uh, Senator McCain's leading option uh, was to pick Joe Lieberman uh, from Connecticut as his running mate. The man Al Gore had had as his running mate only eight years before in the other ticket as kind of a national unity ticket. And the story of how that plan fell apart and how they then turned to Sarah Palin over some deep fried burritos on the Sunday night before the Thursday when McCain was going to make his decision is a pretty interesting one. And again, it puts a full lie to the notion that she had been either seriously considered or seriously vetted in terms of her background. Um, when they picked her, the fact of the matter is two things that I think are, are, that are not commonly thought are both true. One is they're incredibly lucky how well it turned out. For all the troubles they had with Sarah Palin, given how little they knew about her, they didn't go to send anyone to uh, Alaska to look at her background. They didn't interview Todd Palin at all. They didn't talk to anybody even by telephone about her, uh, of her, her political enemies. One lawyer on Google and Nexus over 40 hours looked into her background, and that's it, except for, except for her filling out a questionnaire uh, very quickly. So they're lucky that it didn't turn out worse, given, given how little they knew. And the other thing is, I think that uh, people put too much of the blame on Sarah Palin for the things that went wrong, and not enough on the McCain campaign. They simply did not prepare her or themselves. It was such a last minute thing. On the day they picked her, uh, her campaign staff, who was in charge of responding to media inquiries, were on the Alaska State website and, and Googling. They didn't know how to pronounce her name because they had given no background information. And when you read about what Obama did in his selection of Joe Biden and how meticulous and careful that was, you'll see a study in contrast that's pretty reflective of the two presidential candidates. Um, Started out great, as you'll recall, she gave a great speech in Ohio on Friday when she was unveiled. She gave a great speech uh, at the convention. Uh, the problems then started to manifest themselves. And I think uh, people regularly think about that one of the problems manifested in, in, in her interview with Katie Couric and, and some of her other uh, appearances at the debate uh, was uh, what we euphemistically call a limited bandwidth. Uh, she didn't know as much as she has acknowledged about national and international affairs as, as Joe Biden or, or as a lot of people put on the ticket. What surprised to us as we reported the book is they had two other concerns that were just as big and in, in one case bigger. One is that she was um, not great at telling the full truth when confronted with negative things about her past. Parsimonious with yeah. the truth. Even within the campaign, they would say, well, you know, did you oppose the bridge to nowhere or didn't you? Again, partly their fault because they didn't know the answers in advance, the kind of thing a normal campaign, a rigorous campaign, would know before they picked the person. But she was very uh, uh, stingy with, with, uh, with giving them the full story. She'd always cast things both internally and to the press um, in the most favorable light to herself. And that's a problem in a national campaign. Uh, the second thing uh, is that uh, on the eve of her debate with uh, Joe Biden, she had what many people who were right around her considered to be a nervous breakdown, uh, that she was catatonic. They would literally ask her questions in debate prep or on the road, and she would just put her head down and not answer, literally not respond. And almost all these people around her were absolute strangers to her. So imagine you're a young person involved in a presidential campaign, you're assigned to your party's vice presidential nominee, and you're asking her questions and she's not answering. She wasn't sleeping. They would be in debate prep till late at night, and they'd say, all right, let's go to sleep. Uh, they'd wake up in the morning, they'd have emails from her overnight, she'd be awake, stacks of index cards around, arrayed around her because she liked to work with index cards. So the portrait of their concern about her and going into that debate, that perhaps in the debate itself, she would not respond to questions, was one that surprised us. Because that concern was so strong for them that they felt that if McCain had a chance to win the election, that they were going to have to go to him and say, she, as you plan your transition, she cannot be 
a vice president in the mold of Dick Cheney or Al Gore, the way the office has been elevated, that she would have to be sort of a ceremonial figure because they believed, again, not just in terms of her knowledge, but her temperament, that she was limited in ways that really were dangerous for the country and for the party. Okay, we have uh, three microphones scattered throughout the room, so uh, when you ask your question, please wait for a microphone so we can all hear you. Uh, yes, sir, right here. I have a, a question about McCain. Um, on the news this week, there's something about that he um, was claiming that you know, during the campaign when he went back to D.C. and suspended his campaign, he's now saying he didn't do it, that he really went back because he was summoned by the president. So in view of that, I wanted to ask you, what are some of the surprising things you learned during the campaign about McCain? And then since then, is there anything about him that has surprised you? Well, we were, um, we were uh, amused by Senator McCain's comments this week. Um, uh, again, speaking of parsimonious with the truth. Um, you know, the, the, the incident you're referring to, and it actually goes to, to the, the incident you're referring to actually parts of, is, a part, is a way to answer the question, the broader question. Um, uh, Ms. Senator McCain was, uh, there's so much to say about him, but uh, it, it, by, the, by the time you got to the, to the general election, um, the overwhelming atmosphere in the McCain campaign was one, and I think Mark and I, again, anybody, any, 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 any analyst of the, of, the, of the election would have said that uh, the Republicans were at a disadvantage, um, given, given the, the way the country felt about the Bush years at that point, the president's popularity rating at that point being so low, uh, the right track, wrong track numbers in the country being what they were. People wanted change. Uh, McCain was probably, among all the Republicans, the one who might have been, under some circumstances, the best poised to, 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 to be something who looked like a departure from the Bush administration, but he had had to make various compromises to, to, to get the nomination that made him more Bush-like. So by the time that they started uh, the, the, the general election, the McCain forces were extremely pessimistic, and that atmosphere of pessimism uh, pervaded all of their discussions throughout. And so what many people saw as a series of kind of desperate acts, whether it was uh, putting Sarah Palin on the ticket or the incident that you raised, the question of you know, him suspending his campaign, trying to cancel the first debate, calling this meeting in Washington to go and discuss the bailout bills. The, a lot, all of these things were uh, functions to a large extent of their um, profound sense that they were running into this incredible headwind um, where the combination of the mood of the country with Obama's financial advantage, his organizational advantage, meant that they had to do take kind of desperate measures. They had to do dramatic things to try to change the game, to, you know, to alter the landscape. Um, in the case of the, of the financial crisis, it was you know, the, one of the things that happened in the, in the, in the, in the general election that, that did have a possibility of, of, of really uh, altering the field. And, and we, we have a scene in the book where uh, Barack Obama, the night before, the, before Lehman Brothers collapses uh, in mid-September, you know, says to his, uh, his brain trust, uh, you know, we can't get cocky, um, partly because McCain had been actually sort of surging in the polls, but also because this, this, this he knew from some of his conversations with Hank Paulson and others that there was going to be this, this kind of chaos was about to break out in the markets. And he sort of says to his, Obama says to his team, you know, we could lose this thing still. And uh, what then transpired over the next few days was, you know, the ultimate kind of test of Obama and McCain in a real-time kind of crisis leadership temperament and so on. Obama was very uh, cool and calm and collected. McCain, um, as you remember, the first day after um, the Lehman collapsed, he said the fundamentals of their economy are strong. Um, he, over the course of the next few days, uh, kind of whipsawed back and forth between a bunch of different positions uh, on a number of different important financial regulatory matters, and then decides to, uh, to, to do this thing where he suspended his campaign. And as he, this week, as you said, he uh, has claimed that it was George Bush who asked him uh, to come back to the White House and that he, um, he had nothing to do with that. He was just doing what the president asked. In fact, as you'll see in the book, um, Bush wanted no part of this meeting. And in fact, Bush's attitude toward McCain when McCain called him and said, would you please host a meeting at the White House where I can come back and try to broker a solution. Bush's attitude was, this is a terrible idea. Um, I think I got a deal worked out here. If you show up, it's just going to screw everything up. Are you sure? This is not, this is not the right, like, we don't really want you here. And McCain said, well, I really want this meeting, you know, and Bush hangs up the phone and says, Could, can somebody figure out what's going on with John McCain? Like, what, what's he doing? Uh, and McCain, as they're literally trying to figure out what McCain's game is, they look up on television and see McCain announcing on national television that Bush has agreed to uh, host a meeting. 
Uh, and Bush had never agreed to host the meeting, and they, they were now boxed in, and they had to host this meeting. Um, I think, you know, to answer your question in a very short sentence, I think it was, to, to us, I think it was always surprising uh, just how out of control uh, and how, in many cases, how, uh, seat of the pants is the better word, whether it was the choice of Palin or in the, the, the calling of this meeting, you know, which we show in the book, he does not, he goes, he shows up at this meeting totally unprepared, um, walks in the door to the White House meeting, literally turning to an aide on the way in and saying, what am I supposed to know about this meeting? A meeting that he had called. Um, how, just the degree to which McCain was flying by the seat of his pants, I think, came as a, an endless and, and, and extraordinary surprise to us throughout the reporting of the book. I, th I think there's a word for that. It's called senator. No, just kidding. Um, Cynic. It, in the back, yes. Back when uh, Hillary seemed to be the inevitable nominee for the Democrats, you chronicle an event that takes place in an interview between Maureen Dowd and David Geffen, in which the momentum seemed to dramatically change from Hillary to Obama with some of the money and some of the influence in the Democratic community. I was wondering if you would comment about how important that was and maybe shed some light on that. It was really important because it came early on. Uh, one of the real threats to the uh, to Hillary's uh, campaign was that uh, a lot of the so-called Clinton fatigue that existed in the country would be given voice. And frankly, a lot of people in the party were afraid of the Clintons because the thought was that she would win the nomination. And uh, uh, there's a view of some people, I'm not endorsing it, I'm simply telling you that it's there, that the Clintons have long memories and would come back and, and uh, uh, make, uh, make things even with anyone who went after Hillary. Related to that, and uh, around the same time, uh, or earlier rather, was uh, uh, something we report in the book that, that, that also was a manifestation of this concern that there was Clinton fatigue in the country. In the case of David Geffen and Maureen Dowd, they felt it personally. In the case of some senators, including Senator Harry Reid, the Democratic leader, they felt some Clinton fatigue themselves, but their bigger concern was that it existed in the country that uh, if Hillary were the nominee, uh, she might make a great president if she won, but she would have difficulty winning uh, in, in uh, red parts of the country, um, uh, uh, in purple parts of the country, and they saw no one out there else who could beat her for the nomination. They didn't think John Edwards could or Tom Vilsack or anybody else who was either in the race or thinking of running, and so they quietly encouraged Obama to run. That was an historic moment because although there were other things propelling Obama into the race, the fact that the establishment, long presumed to be uni, uni, uh, formally, monolithically behind Hillary, was in fact not just open to other options, but searching for other options, really gave Obama the confidence to go through. That happened in 2006, but it was subterranean. In fact, most of it has not been reported until our book. What was significant about this thing with Maureen Dowd and David Geffen was, uh, and, and it's, a, it's a fun and funny story, which, which you can read in bad detail in the book, but the, the bottom line was you had a, a leading voice of Hollywood, someone who'd slept in the Lincoln bedroom at the Clinton's invitation, who'd raised a ton of money uh, for the Clintons over the years, uh, speaking out to a, a, a liberal voice from the East Coast, or at least a progressive voice from the East Coast, in terms of Maureen Dowd, in a column where David Geffen basically said his view that the Clintons were not trustworthy, that Hillary would not be an inspiring figure uh, to say the least in his view. And what that did was gave voice to the feelings of a lot of Democrats in elite circles, but also around the country. It gave a lot of people, if not the uh, courage to speak out themselves about these feelings, but the knowledge that other people thought it too. And you see kind of the culmination of that uh, uh, a year later when Senator Kennedy, late Senator Kennedy, for many of the same reasons, although not exclusively, turns to publicly endorse Barack Obama because uh, the result of that was the same in a more public way, which is a lot of Democrats, superdelegates, elite people, felt you could hide behind Ted Kennedy at that point because he was coming out and turning uh, towards Obama. So uh, between those two things, not much happened along those lines. You know, it's easy to forget that Obama did not get a lot of endorsements from prominent Democrats or a lot of people speaking out about these issues that Geffen was so concerned about until the following year. But it laid down a marker and it quietly, even though Geffen did something very public, it quietly gave people who were looking for a way to oppose the Clintons because of so-called Clinton fatigue something to hold on to that 
they weren't the only ones out there feeling these things, either because of animus towards the Clintons or simply a, a, a belief that the Democratic Party would not be well served with Hillary at the top of the ticket, that she would not only lose but cause a cascading down ballot to hurt other Democratic candidates. Uh, I would actually just say further, just very quickly, the other thing that's, fan that's, fa that's fascinating about that, that it was, is that you know, the, the, when, the, when, Geffen, when Maureen Dowd's column came out with Geffen trashing Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton the way that they did, the Clinton campaign just became, was very aggressive in trying to, to make that a story. They, they wanted to, uh, Geffen, they, they, because Geffen was hosting a fundraiser for Obama, they wanted to go to reporters and say, you know, this is extraordinary what this person has done. This person, this Barack Obama is supposed to be a positive candidate, and now here's this big financial backer of his trashing Hillary Clinton and trashing Bill Clinton. You know, they should be criticized for that. And uh, so they pushed the story very hard to try to get Obama to distance himself from Geffen. And what they discovered among reporters was that there was no appetite for that story. And that most national reporters would say, well, what's the story here? And Clinton, Hillary Clinton's people would say, well, he's being, this is, this is hip, hypocritical. You know, Obama's supposed to be new politics, and this is the worst kind of old politics. And the reporters would say, uh, almost uniformly, well, everything David Geffen said is true. So how's that a story? And to the Clinton campaign, that was one of the first most vivid signs in their mind that the press was completely biased against Hillary and was completely in the tank for Obama. And it, you know, they had said sense that Obama was getting a free ride in the first few months of the race. But that moment, that, that it was so embedded in the notion among journalists that calling the president a liar, calling Hillary Clinton divisive, that that was considered true and so therefore not worthy of being criticized in any way or called attention to by the press, that was like a, an omen of what they thought would be, was a very dark omen in terms of how the press coverage would negatively affect Hillary, and it was only reinforced in their view by things that went on over the course of the next year.